welcome back to the 247th episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including how the capitalization of uh, DJT may be fake and how it looks at uh, the broader stock market issues that we may be seeing in an analysis of that. Uh, Biden going to new pollsters to get more positive information about his campaign. And then uh, men and women's sports and the blurring of the lines between the two. And of course, we will end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling for me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. So for those of you out there who have any skepticism about the stock market, do you think that it represents reality anymore? I think I've asked this before. It was somewhere around the 100, 150 mark, somewhere in there. We talked about this. It was a topic that I had explored while I was still in college, and I'd love to know what people have to say, because nowadays we've seen a huge jump in the stock market, especially some of those tech sector stocks, and some people are saying it's a bubble, some people are saying it's not, and some people are saying, like Mark Cuban, it's close, but not necessarily, so there's lots of opinions out there, I'd love to hear yours. Also, on a separate note, I am running out of storage for the article links, so if you have any creative ideas as to how to protect all of those beautiful little article links where anybody who goes to any of the previous episodes can go and look at the articles that are mentioned, uh, I'd love to hear your ideas. So let's jump into our first article that comes from Daily Costs. So we know where Daily Costs comes from. We know their perspective on a lot of different things. They're going to lean a little bit more, and by a little bit more, I mean a lot more to the left. And when they have an article with the headline, the capitalization of Trump's Truth Social, DJT, exposes the stock market as a fraud for all to see. You know where they're coming from. You've heard this talking point from people on the left for quite some time, that they believe the stock market is a whole bunch of hooey. It is basically a mechanism for creating money out of thin air and that at the end of the day, it really only benefits the executives of these corporations, the really wealthy people who are friends who can invest in things like that. And to be honest, this sort of view has leached beyond or how should I say, it is filtered beyond the progressive worldview as well. I mean, I had people that I knew back when I was working summer jobs who said, yeah, uh, you know, I want to do something productive with my life. I want to add value to other people's lives. So while I think I could make a lot of money going into the stock market, I don't think I want to go there. I feel like I'm just leeching off of other people. I'm just taking other people's money, which is a very... A uh, nice way of putting the view that the progressives are putting out here at the daily cost. But that doesn't mean they don't have a point. And for those of you who are progressive, they're like, of course, Alex, what do you mean? Of course we have a point. And for those of you that are conservative, like, whoa, Alex, slow your roll. Wait, what are you saying here? The idea that the stock market is truly purely representative of what's going on within these companies, the value that they have at their core, uh, it, it doesn't hold true anymore. I know there are lots of personal examples where I look at companies, I'm like, uh, the evaluation is really high. I've heard this from lots of different executives saying, we can't believe that our evaluation is this high. We're not going to list any of them here because then they might see a little drop if for some reason this gets shared to some of the shareholders uh, who... I don't know. They may listen. They may not. But the point being that, yeah, there are lots of companies that feel as though their evaluations are way too high. For some people, they'll argue, yeah, just put a, you know, AI kind of statement in there. Put it in the prospectus that we're using AI technology and then boom, your value may shoot up one or two um, points, quote unquote, but just one or two percent during the course of a day. And these are all valid, valid criticisms and concerns that there are lots of different companies where the underlying value is not there when it comes to what you see at their stock price. Now, there is always the argument, okay, so it may not be exactly what they're worth right now, but is it really, really going to be, a, are we going to be able as viewers of the stock market to say, 
hey, okay, I know that this X corporation just got a shipment of new microchips, meaning they fulfilled the order. They're not going to be on uh, any sort of delay. And then, boom, we're going to be able to get those new products out. I'm going to invest an extra uh, $5,000 because I know they're going to be able to complete this order. No, we're not going to have perfect information. We don't have an understanding of all the inside workings. A lot of these reports, uh, you know, some come out in the news, but some of them, some smaller companies that are on the publicly traded things, you're not going to get any sort of idea unless you're in on a board meeting or you're at least getting the notes from the board meeting if you're a shareholder or you are going to see the quarterly reports in some of these cases because not all the board meeting stuff gets out there, which shouldn't be the case. But sometimes it's just hard to find that information. And it's not that they're trying, these companies aren't trying to be transparent, it's just that they're smaller. So they don't actually have a lot of these experts who would say, okay, hey, you need to get this information out this at uh, this time, blah, 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 blah. So you can't have perfect information, so you kind of have to bet on the future. You have to have a basic understanding of what's going on. You have to say, well, I think at the end of the day that this, you know, even political situations, this president's going to do an infrastructure bill. So something that's in a road building sort of operation, a bridge building operation, maybe it'll do a little bit better. So you're not always just betting on what's exactly happening now. You're also looking into the future, which does make it a little bit of speculation, which is one of the big arguments from the daily cost here, which is the market has become oversaturated with speculators. They're just trying to make a quick buck. And that argument for me definitely, definitely holds because not only did I just say that, yeah, you have to project into the future what's going on. So you kind of have to speculate, but also there are robot I was going to say robots, but there are AI algorithms that do this on a microsecond basis. So they say it's not even about the fundamentals of the company. They don't look at the ROI. They don't look at the amount of debt that they're taking on. They don't look at all these other ratios that may give an indicator as to the solid basis. Because if you are to speculate on a company that has a solid base, you're going through, you're like, okay, hey, they're not having to take out too much debt in order to finance some of their new projects. Their return on investment or their return on their debt, uh, their debt utilization ratio, the, all these different ratios, if they're all solid and you say, okay, they're not stretching themselves too thin to get the job done, they're bringing in constant money, they're expanding in different locations, and then you speculate on the future from there, at least you are looking at some sort of raw basis. You are looking at what the company value is now, what they have to offer, what they bring to the table, and what may be served to their table and what they can do in order to expand that table in the future. So there is at least, in this analogy, a table that is sturdy. All the legs are holding, and then you're building the speculation on top. For all you know, some other wrecking ball comes in and destroys the table. But at the end of the day, you're assuming that all of this sturdy underlying stuff is going to hold. Those AI systems that I was mentioning, they don't do that. They look at, okay, well, there's this information out here. Uh, there's these general trends. We're going to make a transaction with millions of dollars right here at this second. And then when it goes up or down or when we see the possibility, when we see these normalized trends, which we've been able to analyze because we have thousands upon thousands of different metrics of data that have been implemented and have been bought, at least the information and the data for it has been bought in order to create this algorithm so we can determine these sort of patterns, then, hey, we're going to buy at this second. We're going to, you know not going too crazy, just a million, no big deal. And then we can buy out two, three seconds later, making just a penny on every single share after we take out all the transaction fees. That is pure speculation. Those are algorithms just looking to make money, not evaluating the companies on whether or not they are good. And our, at this point, we do have algorithms that are good enough to also do calls and puts. They're not as complicated, or sorry, they're not as sophisticated because the process of understanding and looking towards the long-term aspects of an investment, uh, those are a lot more difficult to put in a single-factor uh, AI system or a single-factor algorithm. So while we do have them, they're not quite there, but 
at the end of the day, you know, we're going to probably have these sort of systems soon. Uh, there's probably there, like I said, they're probably already in some of these companies. They're just proprietary, so we don't know too much about them. But at that point, that is even more speculation. It's speculation on top of speculation on top of speculation. And with the small companies, as this doesn't necessarily happen as much, unless an algorithm says, "Hey, we can pump and dump it." Uh, but even then, there's no guarantee. My point being that yes, there are lots, there are lots and lots of factors. Do I think that the stock market is only there to benefit the CEOs and the rich people? No, I, I think at the end of the day, it is actually there to provide a mechanism for people in order to invest in these companies. That was what it was initially there for, and that is what it is still there for today. Do rich people? have a easier time or at least a higher likelihood that they will be able to benefit from that system? Sure, I'm not going to deny that. But let me ask a question for people who are out there that are very progressive. Should we abolish the stock market? Because at the end of this article, and I know I haven't addressed this article too much, because at the end of the day, you probably heard all the ruckus about uh, true social going public. And you've heard all of the things where Trump made all this money and then he lost all this money in amount of time and it's like a meme stock. It's because those things aren't really important. The important conclusion, because the author's pushing a very specific narrative underneath, at the end of the article, they say we need to completely upend this system. So let me pose a separate question to you. Let's say you upend this system. You get rid of the public version of stock trading or stock investing. Then we go back to a system where, hey, companies need to make money, so they put up bonds. Who is going to be more capable of buying more bonds? And who are those companies going to court in order to buy more of those bonds? It's going to be on, you know, some cases when they need small amounts of money, it will be the mom, pop, mom and dad, you know, stores, the local community. Sure. A lot of those are still going to be bought up and by the people that have more means, they have more disposable income in order to buy up more of those bonds or even private investing. Well, guess what? The only people that are actually going to act privately invest in companies are going to be things akin to cap uh, capital or venture capital firms or people with lots of money. So guess what? You're actually making when it comes to investing in a company and not just paying for bonds, which I'm sure you could find an argument against it from a progressive side of the equation as well, because at the end, or a socialist uh, problem with it, because at the end of the day, it shouldn't be publicly, it shouldn't be privately held at all. But <laughs> my point being, the only people that are going to actually be able to invest in those are the larger firms that are out there specifically doing it. They're larger investors, and you're going to cut off the access that the everyday Joe has to buying a chunk of wealth of one of the largest companies. And yes, like I said, it's a little bit different on smaller companies because a small mom and pop shop that employs 50 people that needs a little bit of money can't necessarily go to a bank and wants to issue some bonds out there. Then, you know, let's be clear, this is a rare case, and they I don't know why they would be a publicly traded company anyway, but let's just assume they have a few franchises and they go public and they actually have, uh, let's say, 500 employees. Uh, well, guess what? Any Joe Schmo can buy that. If they're in the community, they can say, yeah, hey, go on to Robinhood, go on to Publix, go talk to your broker and buy some shares versus a private sale, that's going to be a little bit harder at the end of the day. And guess what? You can't put your pension fund in your some of your companies. You can't put any of these different diversified models that you've uh, invested in into these companies. Now, you're going to, these pension funds that are absolutely beloved by so many people who love unions, who have actually gotten these sort of verified returns for their workers, guess what? Those pension funds are, they're going to be a lot trickier. They're going to be, first of all, they're not going to make as much money because they're going to have to be municipal bonds or company bonds or U.S. Treasury bonds, so on and so forth. So there are a lot of things when you just say up in the system that don't necessarily make sense and actually end up hurting the everyday person who wants access to their slice of Capital One, who wants their slice of uh, BlackRock or Vanguard, State Street. The Though it does feel unfair, sometimes do, though it does feel like a speculation world out there on Wall Street, you still have access to it. And because of how built up it is, 
not just because of how ingrained it is, but because of how thorough these systems are and how available they are on the internet, and also because how much these companies want people to invest in them. They're going to make it easy and make sure that they're listed on all of these different stock exchanges. And guess what? Like I said earlier, it becomes a harder practice when we start to strip away this stock market that is there to allow everybody to get their slice of the pie. So that's just deconstructing where the author's coming from, the underlying point. And yes, don't buy DJT. This is not financial advice. I am not a financial planner. Do not buy DJT if you don't want the volatility that comes along with it. If you want to participate in the meme, you do whatever you want to do. Like I said, not financial advice, but it's just absolutely hilarious when you turn something that is totally a meme and a you know one-off news cycle into a way to indict the capital capitalist system without actually pointing at some of the bigger flaws, rather than just saying, "Oh, it's a it's a tool for the millionaires and the billionaires and the CEOs to make their payouts." Which, fair enough, criticism. It, it's true. Now, whether or not you think that's a good thing or a bad thing depends on your worldview, but you don't even attack some of the other more important things that point out how the system is not working properly. Either you don't know or you just don't care or you know, and that's just not the point you're trying to make. But I think some of these other questions are more important, especially the role of people just trying to suck off the system rather than actually build it up. And on that point, when you talk about the CEOs who are just trying to suck off of their company and be leeches and then, you know, jack up their own personal stock, sure, I think that is a very fair criticism. Now, do I think that we need to intervene on that front? Not necessarily. But my point being, we do have to point all of these things out, but maybe expand the scope at which you're pointing out some of the flaws, because I think there are other important things, too which uh, we could actually address more easily without upending the entire capitalist system. And maybe they could rein in some of these uh, bubbles or perceived bubbles that we have. So let's jump to our second article that comes from the Washington Examiner. The headline reads, Don't like the polling results? Biden's new strategy, hire new pollsters. And when I first read this, I was like, oh, um, well, Washington Examiner, I feel like you're kind of being a little mean because I know there were reports about Donald Trump not liking the polls he was getting and finding new people to do his polls as well back in uh, 2020. So, I mean, at the end of the day, everybody just wants to hear what they want to hear. They already have their preconceived notions and they want the data to actually back them up. So is it so surprising that Biden is getting new polling experts? Not necessarily, but there is an underlying message here about the Biden polling issue, and maybe Washington Examiner can give us a little bit of elucidation on it. And yes, I didn't quote from the last article because I wanted to talk about something that they were talking about in an adjacent fashion. This one I want to talk more direct, so we're going to go straight to the article. Quote, Spooked by the results of a Wall Street Journal poll released on Tuesday night that showed former President Donald Trump leading Joe Biden, sorry, President Joe Biden, in head-to-head matchups in six of seven battleground states, the Biden team took immediate action. They hired new pollsters. Politico reported on Wednesday that the Biden campaign hired eight veteran pollsters to lead its number-crunching operation. The outlet explained that the, quote, expansion of Biden's polling team comes at a complicated moment, given Biden's stubbornly low approval ratings and pollsters struggling to measure the electorate accurately in the past two presidential races. It's unclear how adding to their stable of pollsters will help make the president more popular. And obviously, the Washington Examiner is also coming into this article with its priors. Maybe there is a actual thing here where, hey, these are eight genuinely amazing pollsters. And as they even point out, it's been hard to really capture the electorate and use these polls as projections, which polls should never be used as projections. Anyway, even pollsters will tell you this. It just gives a, you know, kind of feeling on the ground and it's never going to capture everybody that you want it to. 
But the idea here is maybe they're bringing in these expert pollsters who can bring in different ideas on how to better capture this electorate. So even if it does show Biden when these new polls that they're creating come out, does show Biden losing, they can understand where they're losing, maybe what issues the people who are not going to vote for him care about. These are important questions. So to just easily dismiss Joe Biden as saying, oh, well, he's just going to find people that confirm his bias. Uh, one, we're going to have to see if new polls come out that he doesn't like and he hires eight more pollsters. Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe you could make that argument. But at this point, we don't necessarily know. But maybe I'm in too good of a mood. Maybe that last article was just too much icing on top of the cake. It was just the perfect thing that I love to break down. So maybe I'm just a little too joyous and I'm not being cynical enough. But I don't have to be the cynic in this case. I'm going to let the Washington Examiner do it. Quote, the Wall Street Journal survey also asked voters which candidate was better equipped to handle the top issues. And this was breaking news when it came out. And this is really important to actually have a deeper understanding of what could be concerning for Biden. Quote, on the economy, 54% chose Trump compared to 34 for Biden. Uh, any category that the winner stated, I'm just going to give the percentage and then the winner. I don't want to read all of these breakdowns one by one because they give both and it's just annoying. Uh, Trump prevailed by a margin of 52% to 32% uh, for when asked about immigration and the border, uh, mental health and physical fitness. That's Trump 48 uh, and actually, okay, never mind. I take it back. I'm going to talk about Biden on this one. Biden, 28. I mean, Trump, 48. Biden, 28. That's a gap of 20 points. And neither candidate is breaking 50%. But Biden's below 30, just above one-fourth. Okay, that does not look good for Joe Biden. I don't care what pollsters get after this. It, you're not. You're not changing that. You're not changing that, okay? And I'm not saying like, oh, if you get new post, post uh, pollsters, you're changing that. No, no, no. Uh, you're you're not changing that easily. That is something where you have to be out there on the ground. You have to have lots of media coverage, and not just of you being there and doing your normal routine, which is obviously it was what has gotten you to the point now where people are like, ooh, Biden, uh, I don't know, buddy. Not looking so good. You got to be out there looking competent. You got to make sure that you're on tip top shape. You got to make sure whatever drugs they're giving you are amazing. Give you the best crack cocaine with a little bit of the mellow dello drug just to make sure you don't go too crazy. And yes, I am making a joke, but I'm pretty sure that we all know that uh, Biden is probably taking something in order to get through some of his major speakers' uh, speeches. If J JFK, if JFK had to take drugs, then again, the argument is he was probably addicted, but if JFK had to take drugs to get through certain things, then I wouldn't be surprised if every single president at some point has taken some drugs in order to get through certain things. And also, the fact that Joe Biden was on top of it, or at least had a lot of energy at the beginning of some of his speeches, and he's kind of trailed off the arguments there. It is unconfirmed. I'm not saying it's 100%. Maybe I'm being a little bit hyperbolic. Maybe I'm being a little jokesy. Maybe it's funny to say the president's on a little bit of that go-go juice. But at the end of the day, that number, that 28%, is going to be very hard to turn around unless you get your cocktail just right. All right. And what's the last one? This is the one where Biden's actually leading. Biden was better able to handle the abortion issue. And the statistics come down 45%, 33%. So also, Trump at only one-third? One-third? That is not good. At least, I mean, what, the pro, the really, really pro-life base is probably 5 to 10% of this country at the absolute max, and that's not even taking it to the absolute maximum pro-life stance. I just mean the people that are very, very passionate that would say, like, a month, okay? That's probably 5 to 10% of the population max. So, you know, you get rid of those. That's 23% of the rest of the public. Whew, Donald Trump, that... That issue, especially because of how politically motivated people are about abortion, that's going to come back to bite you in the booty. So the real question is, is Trump going to hire some new pollsters to be like, hmm, uh, I need to actually have some really strong numbers showing that I'm really favored by uh, a lot of people on the abortion issue and that they think I can handle it in a proper way? 
or is he going to fall away and try to pretend that this has never happened because he doesn't want to raise the issue? Probably going to be that last one. Trump does not want to take on the pro-life issue, the uh, pro-choice issue. It's just not going to be on the top of his agenda to talk about because, one, we know that people are very politically motivated for the pro-choice side, but, two, even among pro-lifers, he is not there. He is not far enough down that line. He's better than Joe Biden, but he's still not far enough down that line. So if he talks about it more, the people who are willing to bite the bullet now and say, yeah, well, we're going to vote for Trump over Biden because he's just better on the abortion stuff. Even if I don't agree with where he's drawing the line, he's better. Even they may get tired of it and they might not want to bite that bullet anymore if he keeps talking about it. I think he knows that. So let's jump on to our final article. This one comes from Real Clear Politics. Should women compete? Sorry, who should compete in women's sports? And the photo they have here at the beginning is uh, Riley Gaines and a few other supporters out there protesting. She's got a really bold sign that says, Our bodies, our sport. And the whole idea of this article is talking about biological men who identify as women coming into women's sports. And obviously, there's a lot of contention around this one. And there is no doubt that it is going to be a hotly debated topic going on into the future. Now, is it going to be the most politically motivating topic out there? Definitely not. But the reason that I wanted to bring up this one is because there's a recent thing going on in Wisconsin that highlights how important this is and how it's back in the front of the news cycle. Quote, some of these issues were on the table again this week in Wisconsin. The state legislator in Madison passed a law protecting biological women, the fashionable term is cis women, from competing against transgender women in sports. The governor, a progressive Democrat, promptly vote- vetoed the bill. And then the author goes on to give the reason why. Quote, The governor did not want to risk being caught on the wrong side of that fault line, basically describing the wing or the part of the Democratic side that believes that it is not inclusive, that it's dangerous, that it could harm transgender people to not allow them to compete in women's sports because it is not actively affirming their gender. Uh, Quote, he may also believe quite sincerely that the veto was an eth- the ethical thing to do. It's always hard to separate pol- politicians' pr- ethical principles, if there are any, from hard-nosed calculations. I mean, wow, whew, this article is getting more cynical than I am right now. Uh, but this is extremely important. This is a battle that has been going on for a while now. Riley Gaines has been on the front of it, and it's going to keep going on for as long as transgender athletes are going to be able to participate in biological sports. If this, if a transgender athlete, if someone who is saying, I am a woman, but was born a man, went through a male puberty, that's going to change their bone density. density. It's going to change the capacity of their muscles. And yes, even if you take hormones, there are still after effects of going through puberty. Is that going to be safe for the women in those areas? Is it going to be fair for the women in those areas? Uh, it, safe, depending on the sport? No. And fair? Probably not. Uh, I think the only Olympic level sport that does not have a gender divide is equestrian something. Uh, It's an equestrian show, essentially, where the jockey has to be able to manipulate the horse. And guess what? Men and women can both do that without much biological difference. Weightlifting, there's a difference. Uh, gymnastics, there's a difference. Even though th- you know most of them are probably going to be around the same stature because that's actually what's really important, there's still going to be different muscle strengths. Uh, on the trampoline, guess what? That's still divided. Even though a lot of the athleticism comes down to being able to manipulate your body, having a different muscle structure, bone structure, actually affects how you're able to manipulate your body in the air. So it's just, it, we're confronting this biological reality. We're hitting this stone wall with our head and pretending that the more we beat our head against it and the stupider we get about this issue the more we are able to tear down that wall and i just don't think it's going to happen anytime soon so this is going to keep on going on we're going to see a lot of parents who want their kids to be able to go into these sports leagues have a fair time not be dissuaded from pursuing their goals trying their hardest being the best at something or even just having a fun time without having to worry about being trounced on by a biological male claiming to be a woman, then, hey, 
this is going to keep being a thing until we say no. You get your own league. Okay, how about that? You you want to compete in these sports so bad? Let it let's get you your own league. That's even that is even more affirmation. That is even more love. We love you so much. We're going to make an entirely separate league just for you to make sure that you can participate. You can actually get what you want without hurting anybody else. Beautiful thing, right? Maybe we should actually consider it. But no, that would be too complicated, and then that wouldn't actually affirm their beliefs. So uh, maybe that would be harder than we would like to believe, but whatever. So let's jump to our final article, our daily delight. We've gone through some negative topics. We've gone through some funny topics. We've talked about go-go juice, which I didn't think was a subject I was going to get to in this podcast, but somehow we got there. So let's jump to this cute article that comes from Parade Pets. Rescue tiger at Oakland Zoo looking at bubbles is a wonder, and it is very innocent while doing so. So, honestly, the the guy, he's he's like poking at it. He's trying to get the bubbles. He doesn't necessarily understand what's going on at first. He just knows that it's entertaining, and his fascination is amazing. If you want more details or you want to see the video or any of the photos from this article or you want to read any of today's articles, you can find the link in the description below that like and subscribe button. Also down there, you can find the link to the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, and Podvine. The link to Google Podcasts is there. I don't know if it's still up and running. I've been able to reach the back end. That doesn't mean on the front end you can still see everything. And also down there will be the Twitter tirade link or the Twitter link at your daily flip where you can go watch the Twitter tirade every Tuesday and Thursday, short form, less formal, just kind of off the top of the head, something that I'm reading or just a random thought I had while I was walking. So with all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.